Can you hear me okay? Well, after a few little technical difficulties, I'm hoping we're going to be good to go here. So I was tasked with uh, talking about lameness today and, and joint diseases specifically, but I think I want to talk more, a bit more generally about lameness because it's a big issue in the feedlot. So, you know, if you look here at this diagram, five, roughly 6% of the cattle are treated for lameness, uh, you know, which is next to BRD at about 10%, and then, of course, everything else is less than that. So it is a significant uh, cause of morbidity. And when we look at it more specifically, it's an animal welfare concern. Uh, as well as economic, 28% of all the treatments that occur in the feedlot are due to lameness and 49% of the cattle that are euthanized. And there's at least a $200 production cost if you tally in uh, culls and treatment costs and labor and everything all together. So if you break the pie out, I guess this is maybe one of the reasons I wanted to kind of talk about uh, lameness in general. You can see that this is data from Dr. Sonia Marti at the Lethbridge Research Center. Only about 5% of the cattle are actually treated for joint disease. So there's a pretty good chunk of that pie that's everything else. And I think if you have a good sense of what all those other things are, then you're having, gonna have better success treating the joint infections. So when you look at that particular diagram, she saw a lot of digital dermatitis. She looked at three feedlots across Alberta over a two year period. We don't tend to see that in our feedlots, but we do see certainly all the other things there. And if you don't have a lot of digital dermatitis, then the foot rod is gonna take up a bigger part, piece of that pie. So that, that pie size may change relative to your feed yard, but the joint infection part is pretty predictable. I'd say it's in that five, 6% range. And that of course would depend on calves versus yearlings. So just to kind of quickly summarize, it's, there's multiple causes. They can be very difficult to t treat, which can depend on the cause and severity. And there's economic considerations, obviously, in all these, all these situations. But ultimately, a successful outcome improves with an accurate diagnosis. So with that, I'm gonna kinda run you through what I call the, the cowboy quiz. And you can kinda look at these, I'm gonna give you a little bit of uh, opportunity to look at some different kinds of lameness in these videos and slides. So, you know, if you wanna shout it out or if you wanna give your thoughts on what's going on here. So if you look at that foot, you can see some swelling there, just you know, and spreading of the duke or spreading of the claws from the back, inflammation in the foot, swelling, and then if you were to compare the left and right feet, you would see that those dew claws are pushed apart. And that's the the classic split you see in, the, in between the toes when you spread those feet apart. So of course that is foot rot and that's in most feed yards going to be the biggest chunk of what you're treating. I think the, the important thing is it responds well to antibiotics and a failure of response within a few days usually means you've, you've got an incorrect diagnosis. So these would be a set of calves that are about three days in the feed yard. Left hind lame, the left is probably a coincidence, but uh, the hind limb part isn't. This is a pretty common disease to misdiagnose. Oops, take a look at another one here. So that classic hind limb hopping gait. If you look at those feet closely, you'll see that sort of that split between the, the hoof wall and the sole. There's another one, that, that calf was zero days on feet. It actually died on the truck. It got trampled and uh, when I necropsied it, it had already developed that lesion in the toe. Some of these you'll see, you don't see the lesion as obviously, but if you put a hoof tester on and squeeze it, you'll see pus coming out. And, or, the, or you may, it might only be as a pinhole, or you what may just get that? pain. So this is toe tip necrosis, which we, you know, there's the classic uh, lesion in the toe, of the, the bone of the toe, there's the hoof wall, the bone in, in, encapsulating the coffin bone. You can see the infection. So toe tip necrosis, separation of the hoof, the sole and the hoof along the white line. 
typically affects recently arrived feedlot cattle, more commonly in calves, but we certainly see in yearlings. And I think the important part of this is that it can be as early as zero days on feed. And I know historically, even I misdiagnosed this, I suspect, years ago as injuries do when processing, running them through the chute. And the outer claws is typically more commonly affected. And it's the belief to be in a, a trauma. The cause is still somewhat debated, but it's believed to be trauma from cattle treading on coarse surfaces and either abrading or fracturing that, ho that white line. And temperament, you know, if you, anyone who's dealt with this will, would agree that temperament is often a factor. So the back feet are often more, it's usually the outer claw of the back foot as well, and that's because the outer claw bears more weight. So when those animals scramble, they're exerting a much greater force on those outer claws. Uh, so the diagnosis, it's usually early in the feeding period, one to three weeks, maybe as early as day zero. They usually will have a fever, and you'll usually get a response with a hoof tester. And it does seem like many of these respond to antibiotics. It's because we see these cases, we, we presume that's what they are, we treat them and a lot do get better, but uh, the ones that go on to develop that bony lesion, high mortality in those. So that's how we, you know, we tip the, we've done some work tipping the toes to drain the abscess. I think we're still trying to decide whether that's efficacious or whether that helps or hinders, but that's a case where we've tipped it and there's pus draining. And we've also done a little bit of work just this year putting a block on the, the healthy claw, which is relatively easy to do, just trying to see if that helps, you know, support that foot better and take the weight off the diseased claw. So an animal probably a couple months in the feed yard. Looks like this aspect ratio is a little wacky there, but if you look at it from the back, you'd see that's a little swollen across there. So that's just trauma. And it's pretty easy to confuse that with joint disease, but that's the, fe the shaft of the femur there and a fracture across there. So common in feedlot setting, cattle riding, handling injuries, heavier cattle more susceptible, really, that's just physics. And treatment of fractures is really obviously not practical. So prompt euthanasia or on-farm slaughter. Case number four. <laughs> I kind of mentioned this earlier. You may or may not have this in your feed yards. If you have it, uh, you probably know about it. If you, if you don't, good for you. It's becoming more prevalent in feedlots and it, it's a challenge to manage. Again, kind of easy to confuse that with other diseases if you don't pick the foot up. You know, in acute lesions, you'll see these sort of ulcerative lesions just over the heels. It's a little more proliferative in that, in that picture. And these are a little more chronic, where that one's starting to dry up, that one's less so. But that's digital dermatitis. So very common in disease of dairy cattle worldwide. It's highly contagious, and it's becoming more prevalent in feedlots. I know in southern Alberta, they struggle with some, this in some yards. We fortunately don't have it. Uh, the key though is that you get a poor response to therapy. So you may be thinking you're treating foot rot and they're not responding. This would be an example of why you have to re reassess your diagnosis. If you do ever, you know, suspect that you're gonna need some veterinary help because managing it on a, you know, in a dairy they'll apply a tetracycline compress to that lesion and bandage it on for a couple of days. That's obviously not practical in a feed yard. So you'll be looking at potentially foot baths and, and different kinds of uh, quarantine strategies. I guess we don't have to belabor this one too much. I think Dr. Penner covered it off rather nicely. I think that's in that data set about 0.7% of the cattle that become lame. So that's just laminitis, right? There's a healthy foot and there's a laminitic foot. He mentioned the overgrowth of the sole and as that bone 
is that attachment of the, the coffin bone to the hoof wall breaks down, then the tendon behind will pull up on that bone and cause that bone to rotate. Then you get that pressing down on the sole, which is very painful. So it's obviously commonly observed in feedlot cattle. It's, it's related to the carbohydrate diet, but probably as Dr. Penner mentioned, it's more related to periods of restriction. No effective treatment, so market them in a timely manner. So this is a bit of a, I guess, a, not, you're probably not going to see this. But if you were to, and it's possible that you could, you'd want to recognize it. This is a pen of cattle that was, actually this was a feedlot in western Canada that had a number of pens of these calves on feed through the, through the fall. And as the fall progressed and the weather got colder, we started seeing these lame cattle in those pens. Initially, the pulling them for foot rot didn't help, so uh, I think then they called it veterinary advice and realized that they were dealing with quite a different situation. Any takers on that? Very good, you bet. Surprising, you know, we submit feed samples from, you know, when we get uh, clients send us sound, uh, mill run pellets and whatnot. It's amazing when we send those to the lab how many of those come back high and get these days. So it is out there for sure. You'll be, you know, you might see this kind of a, you know, line of demarcation between healthy and, and what's becoming uh, devitalized tissue. In a more severe case, you'll actually get sloughing and then you, you might see what they refer to as the corn cob tail. But that's the fungus uh, claviceps purpura. It grows on, on grains and cereal grains and grasses in the growing, you know, cool, wet spring followed by a hot summer. And it produces a toxin that both damages and constricts the vessel. So if you look at the a normal artery, that's, that's what it would look like. In an affected artery, you have this thickening of the middle layer of the artery, as well as the, the, the vasoconstriction that's caused by that, those compounds. So you get lots of vasoconstriction along with thickening, and you can clearly see why you have loss of circulation. Add, add cold weather to that, and that's why you have, start to see feet sloughing. So most often hind legs are affected, tips of the, tears and, tips of the ears and tail, and uh, that, you know, that would be a fairly severely contaminated sample. So we're on to the joint infections part, and uh, so two to three animals per thousand. Mycoplasma infections are probably the most prevalent. Histophilus, some of the other ones, extension of foot rot, extension from toe tip necrosis. But mycoplasma would be the most prevalent in a feedlot situation. So it's an important respiratory pathogen. It spreads from the lungs to the joint by the bloodstream. And it does cause significant mortality. You know, even though we're not treating a lot of cattle, for these diseases, we see a lot of them in the chronic pen, and that's why I think everyone gets frustrated with the treatment. Uh, many, many of these calves will have a pre-existing history or treatment for pneumonia, and so the typical symptoms are a sudden onset of moderate to severe lameness, joint swelling, usually 20 to 40 days thereabouts after being on feed, uh, just because it's following your epidemic curve of BRD plus or minus a fever, depending on how early in the stages you catch them. And usually it's the large joints that are most affected, the, what they call the rotator joints, hip stifles, hawk shoulder. Systemic antibiotics are really our only choice, but I think you have to pick drugs that penetrate into the joint tissue, and that's the important, the key to that. And they have to maintain proper, you know, proper levels to kill that organism. So unfortunately, there's little data on this. You know, we, we use a lot of these drugs that we use for BRD, for joint treatment, but the data is not that strong on exactly, you know, there's a paper published where it showed that new floor will stay in the joint fluid for about four days, but that was at a level that would treat the bacteria that causes foot rot. So there's not a lot of data out there exactly which drugs you need to use for how long to maintain a high level of antibiotic in the joint space that would kill mycoplasma. And so the, the amount of drug you need in there also is pathogen dependent. It's going to depend on which bacteria. Uh, 
So we'll just kind of look at a few of these different kinds of lamenesses, or I guess it's different joints. These are all pretty good examples of microplasma, kind of before and afters I've taken, just to kind of give us a sense of, so that's, you know, that was back in, I guess, late December. That's that same calf uh, about a month ago, so it's coming around pretty much on the mend. I apologize. This is an animal, obviously, that's non-weight-bearing, stifling infection. It was taken in Janu early January. That's that same calf, you know, three weeks later. Minimal improvement. So, you know, these things do are slow to heal. I think that's one of the keys we have to remember, that they're not going to be like a foot rot that just bounced back. This is an animal that's, you know, I, I put, took videos of this because it's an animal that was in kind of thin body condition back in January. Last week, so now with this cold snap, I think that's an animal that we would have to reassess and determine whether we're going to have to do So again, just looking at different joints. Here's a shoulder taken late January. Here's that same calf, almost almost sound again. Hawk infections, we, you know, those are ones that I think do poorly. This, you know, this is an older animal, it may not be mycoplasma. These aren't always mycoplasma, but certainly in calves, in that, you know, first couple months on feed, mycoplasma is the most prevalent, but there are other bacteria that can cause it. But certainly I find that the hawk infections do not do as well. This is a bull calf uh, that had, a, had the right front knee affected. Yeah, he was coming for me. <laughs> so this one, I, I don't recommend this, but because of the value of that particular animal, he didn't respond to a couple doses of systemic therapy, so I actually did a joint injection on that one with an antibiotic. I, I mean, that's a bit tricky. You have to be very clean in your technique. I mean, it's, it's kind of do as I say, not as, not as I do. And so I don't necessarily recommend you doing that, but it is an option in certain kinds, certain animals. So here's that calf uh, late last month. You know, and he'll probably go on to be completely sound. And this is an animal that, that we ended up euthanizing. So these, some of them, you know, they don't all come around. That was non-weight bearing on, on infection in the knee. So just back to drug selection, pay it to, you have to do think about what you're going to be using, new floor, res floor. Some of the macrolides and tetracyclines do distribute into the joints. You want to start your treatments early. You probably need to have more than one treatment. And the important thing is mycoplasma is a slow-growing organism. So you have to have antibiotic present in that joint for a prolonged period if you're going to have a successful outcome. And I think you probably need to work with your veterinarian on periodic culture and sensitivity testing. Uh, penicillins, these do not work on mycoplasmas because mycoplasma has a cell membrane but not a cell wall. And these drugs work by inhibiting cell wall synthesis. So they may work for other kinds of joint infections, but they won't work on mycoplasmas. So I uh, just kind of recap, the treatment response tends to be slow, but with time many of them will come around. That could be three to six weeks. I think appropriate chronic, pair, can, chronic pen care is essential. The easy access to bedding, feed and water, and monitor them closely. I think the chronic pen, they should be gaining a pound or so a day over a period of time. And you may have to, you know, euthanize or salvage slaughter as indicated. Of course, salvage slaughter becomes a bit of a challenge if you've medicated them with one of those long-acting antimicrobials. So just to, why are some outcomes poor? You know, this is a normal joint cut open. This is a mycoplasma joint, so significant damage around the joint. It's not just inside the joint, like some of these in joint infections. There's a lot of peri what we call periarticular damage, you know, fibrin in the joint, abscesses forming around the periphery of the joint. You can see the cloudy joint fluid. So, and they do, these will also extend up along tendon sheaths, so that's another reason you may have poor outcomes. <coughs> 
And of course, don't forget that these often have a pneumonia. Virtually all the cattle that get a mycoplasma joint infection will have some degree of pneumonia. It may be minor enough that it's, you only see it microscopically, but it may be like this too, where you've got half the lung involved and there's you know, a cross section of what those mycoplasma lungs look like. A lot of pus in the airways. And so you, know, you may have a calf that's mildly lame, like that one we showed earlier that was losing body condition, but you, you always have to bear in mind the lung condition. So a little bit on just distal li limb infections. What can we do and how do you diagnose them? So this infection here is down here in this coffin joint, what we call the coffin joint. My experience with these is it's another one that's very, very painful. They do not respond well to treatment. So what do those look like? I mean, there's your classic swelling at the coffin bone, or just, sorry, just above the hoof coming up from the coffin joint. So, you know, over time, we've, uh, you know, we've shot a lot of cattle like that just because of animal welfare reasons. So the last couple of years, or last year or so, we've done a little bit of work doing amputations on these. So it does sound radical, but kind of bear with me momentarily here. Uh, it does require a veterinarian. Uh, it's a v it is an easy surgery to perform, though. It doesn't take any longer than a, literally, than a rumen fistula or a water belly surgery. And you have very good outcomes when it's only a single claw. But this is the key. You have to have a tilt table. At least, I shouldn't say you have to. I, I have done the odd one in proper restraint in a chute, but a tilt table makes it very easy. And I guess my... My hope as a practitioner is that tilt tables become somewhat common in feedlots because we use this thing all the time now. Uh, so just to kind of show you what that looks like. So this animal, is just, you know, it's probably could be shipped. It's got, it, it is bearing some weight on that foot. So I'll just, so there's that, you know, that's the foot of that animal, the swelling just above the, above the claw. So it's a unilateral infection in that joint, that coffin joint. So what the technique is, you put a tourniquet on that limb, and then you just put a needle into that artery, which is pretty easy to hit. And then we infuse it with lidocaine, about 15, 20 mils of lidocaine. And we've got the cow, one of the cowboys, or a couple of them trained at this feedlot. They'll do all this prepping for us. They can hit that vein quicker than I can. So then you make your incision just above the claw. So I'm, you can see the animal doesn't flinch at all. That foot is very well froze. It doesn't have, you know, because you're making an open wound, it's not, you know, those feet are sterile, or they're, sorry, they're surgically prepped, but they're certainly not sterile. So you make your incision around that claw. That's where I'm just coming into the joint. So we're going to separate it at the second joint of that foot. So the first joint is kind of down here. That's what it looks like once the, the claw is off, and literally that takes a few minutes. Throw a bandage on it for a week or so, and that's 10 days later. You get a nice bed of granulation tissue forming. And that's that animal three weeks later. So just to give you another kind of good example, this is an animal that's non-weight bearing on that limb. And these are, these are animals that we would often euthanize. We had in the past, I, many, many of these cattle got euthanized because they can't be shipped, of course, if they're non-weight bearing on a limb. And this is that calf three weeks later. So it's a, it's a bit of a radical procedure, but it's not complex. It does require veterinary assistance and the proper equipment, but very good outcomes. So it is a, it is a, a, a a solution to some of those, you know, those distal limb infections. So kind of just as a summary of what we've talked about, an accurate diagnosis in any of these lame cattle is essential. Prompt, appropriate, and aggressive treatment is important, I think, especially with the mycoplasmas, getting on them early, treating them long enough to make sure you've got sustained drug level in those joints. You know, think about pain management. I mean, if you're using Resflor, there is uh, Flunixin in that product, so you are getting some pain management anyway. But if not, you know, there is oral meloxicam now, which uh, is, does give good pain management. And I think the key to kind of what, the message I want to bring to you is that those, particularly the mycoplasmas infections, 
you do have to allow them some time to recover, but you do have to pay attention monitoring the, the chronic pen. In more advanced cases, you can think about amputation. I, I mentioned regional limb perfusion here. I guess uh, regional limb perfusion is exactly what that process is when we do the block off for surgery. So in, once we put the tourniquet on, we put a needle in that vein, we push antibiotic into there, and then we leave it for about 15 minutes. And that gives very high levels of drug in that distal part of that limb. And then after that, we remove the, the tourniquet. We're, we're, we're sort of in the research phase on that. You know, we're trying to determine whether that really is very effective. But one thing is, at least for joint infections, but certainly for chronic foot rots, we'd had, we've had excellent outcomes with, with regional limb perfusions. So again, it's, it's a technique we're looking at. It's not anything I sort of generally in recommending, but it's something we're going to continue to work with to see if we can make that practical. Uh, I think they mentioned in my bio that I hike and kayak and canoe up in the Arctic. This was a picture I took up near Ellesmere, well, on Ellesmere Island about four years ago. This family, there's actually, there were six of them, this family of muskox, where we came up to our campsite for the night thinking that we, when we saw these that they would just bolt we set up our tents about 75 meters away and they just sort of stood there and looked at us for about two hours uh, before they just eventually just wandered off. Probably because they don't see people very often. That's 700 miles from the North Pole. So it's a long ways from anywhere. Anyway, thank you for your attention. <laughs>